This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers. And good evening. Today is Wednesday, September 28th, 2024. This is the Zoning Board of Appeals for the City of East Hampton. This is, uh, we'll call the order of the meeting. Is there anyone interested in having anything to say that is not pertaining to the hearing that is before us this evening? Give me a date correction. Yeah. Or did I say the wrong date? Yeah, you said the 28th. I'm sorry. Okay. The 18th. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's written correctly. All right. And uh, we do not have any meetings from prior meeting, any minutes from the prior meetings, correct? Nope. No, nothing for this meeting, anyways. All right. And so at this time, we will call to order the meeting for uh, application for 385 and 391 Main Street via Community Builders. This is a continuation of a meeting started 7 31, 2024. Continued to 8 14, 2024, and 9 11, 2024. The applicant is seeking a comprehensive permit to create 87 new and rehabilitate 40 existing affordable rental units subject to Mass General Law Chapter 40B. The applicant is proposing three new buildings on 55.54 acres. The proposal is located at 385 and 391 Main Street in an R35 zoning district. At the conclusion of our previous meeting, we were uh, at com completed section A of the reading of the decision. Uh, at this point, we have all of the those modifications have been updated in the latest version that we have before us. Um, I guess the one thing I do want to bring up is that since then, we have received a uh, notice from um, the previous uh, city engineer for the city pertaining to the sewer line that was installed or or, or potential sewer line connection. Uh, so I will read what he has said. Um, as the retired city engineer for the city of East Hampton, I wish to provide my comments concerning the proposed comprehensive permit at 385 Main Street. Let me first say that I am fully in support of the project going forward which will increase our supply of affordable housing units. However, I have concerns with the condition of the existing sanitary sewer system on Main Street. This project will discharge in excess of 10,000 gallons per day of sanitary flow to an already overburdened sewer main. This is not a new issue. Over the years, the city has accepted sanitary flow from several businesses in Southampton, namely Big Y, the Red Rock Plaza, and the former Harley-Davidson building and others. Accepting this flow into the city of East Hampton sewer system is the correct thing to do. We do benefit from the surcharges on the sewer fees. My concerns are that simply dumping a large new flow into the, new, into the main will impact the existing sewer users downstream. Prior to my retirement, I had worked on a preliminary design for a new sewer line from Main Street down to the interceptor sewer along the bike path across the undeveloped land at map 154, lot four. A sanitary manhole was installed on the bike path sewer main to accept future flow from Main Street. The idea was to divert all the extra flow from the southern end of Main Street to a, across private property and into the newly installed bike path sewer main. This would relieve much of the burden on the existing sewer main. This concept was never put forward at the time However, with the potent substantial flow coming from the proposed project to 385 Main Street, now would be the time to pursue this work. The work would require obtaining an easement from the property owner of the undeveloped land. Approximately 1,200 lineal feet of new sewer main would be needed. How this work would be funded is a question for others, but I feel that this is the time to pursue, pursue this prior to the development of the proposed large new housing project. And please pass along my comments to the zoning board during their approval process for the comprehensive permit. Signed, Jim Garsha, city engineer retired. So with that in mind, I do know we have uh, Greg Nuttleman, the current city uh, 
of Public Works Supervisor. Um, can you address that commentary in some way, sir? Yes. Uh, so prior to us paving, we paved Wimelco Way last year, 2023. I think it was in 2021. We installed a eight inch sanitary sewer line from the interceptor, um, the end of Wimelco that Jim's referring to in his letter to the top of Wimelco Way. And we've spoken with the developers of this project to getting on getting their sanitary sewer flow into that manhole which and onto Wimelco Way and down to the interceptor, that route rather than the route that Jim has described in the letter he prepared. Okay, so in basically, so what you're saying is that the the discharge from this development would be a dedicated line down the eight inch line on Wilmelco Way. Oh, not not dedicated, but uh, there's some other things on it. But it it makes the volume of flow on Main Street irrelevant because it will never hit Main Street. It will hit Wilmelco Way and then the rail the rail trail interceptor pipe. All right. Thank you for addressing that concern. All right, at this time, we will continue reading the uh, decision for the city of East Hampton. Uh, having finished section one at the previous meeting, we will now start with section B, uh, affordability. And Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, just to point out changes from the last one. Oh, yes, please. Aware. Yes. Um, just some minor ones, such as the date obviously is updated and the date in line two. I've updated that as well, just to include September 18th. Um, on factual findings, on um, simple leave number 19, I've included that language of the bird for bird testimony from the applicant. That is the stormwater protection plan and design, so I've included that language. Uh, I removed that language about the finding, uh, that traffic related finding that we did not make. Uh, and then number 25, uh, the board finds this will add. 43.1 acres of conserved land consistent with the East Hamptons open space plan. Uh, that has been uh, included as well. And I believe those are the changes that were requested at the last meeting. Other than that, um, yeah, you can continue. All right. Dylan or Mr. Chair, when did we take comments on those? From the public? Um, we're going to read through the decision, at okay. which point we will make, we will hear comments from the public. Okay. Thank you. Carol? I might as well start. I'm, I'm, I'm on a roll right now. <laughs> uh, section B, affordability, except as may otherwise be allowed by the subsidizing agency -E -A -E -O -H -L -C or other subsequent subsidizing agency, pursuant with the applicant with the applicable subsidy programming, a minimum of 25% or 32 units of the rental units shall be reserved for income eligible households, meaning they shall be rented to and occupied by households whose income adjusted for household size is not more than 80% of the area median income, AMI, as determined by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. And the subsidizing agency, the affordable units, notwithstanding the preceding language which still prevails, the applicant has proposed that 100% of the units in the project is reserved for affordable units, with 21 units being rented and occupied by persons making not more than 30% AMI, 83 units being, muted, being rented and occupied by persons making not more than 60% AMI, and 23 units being rented and occupied by persons making not more than 80 percent AMI for affordable units shall upon intiguous intentional design designation be dispersed throughout the project in accordance with the guidelines of the subsidizing agency except for fluctuations based on changes of household eligibility income allowed by the regulatory agreement the applicant shall be responsible for maintaining records su sufficient to comply with the subsidizing agency guidelines for the location of affordable units in the project and occupancy of such affordable units by income eligible households. As we set forth more fully in the regulatory agreement, the location of the affordable units may change in the event that the income of the household occupancy occupying an affordable unit increases beyond allowable program unit limits. 
The board acknowledges that affordable unit location is an issue within the exclusive jurisdiction of the subsidizing agency. All of the four projects affordable units shall be restricted for rental to households earning not more than the maximum allowable household income adjusted for household size and determined by EOHLC or any substitute subsidizing agency. The affordable units shall be maintained as affordable in, perpetu in perpetuity which for the purposes of this decision shall mean for so long as the property does not comply to applicable zoning requirements within the benefit of this comprehensive permit. The applicant Mr. shall- Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, just kind of, I don't know how you want to handle it, Peter Freeman for the applicant. Um, yes, there, are, there, there are side notes, there's just not many, a few places where we suggested some changes and this is one of them noted uh in dylan's side comment that the applicant had requested rather than perpetuity that it be uh, 40 years and that's more in line with program requirements so you're you're asking for a 40 year rather than until zoning is changed well rather than saying uh in, in perpetuity would say in 40 years it could still say or until you know um unless sooner it would have to change to say unless uh sooner you know it complies okay and what does the board have to say about that or the thoughts from the board on that um, i don't have a problem i think it's pretty standard yeah it's happened a lot and you know, the only thing that really goes past the uh, 40 years and then it's much. All right, Paul, what is your thought on that? So, Mr. Chairman, the standard is affordability in perpetuity. Um, there is actually case law from the Supreme Judicial Court that notes that if a decision is silent on the term of the affordability, that it'll be affordable in perpetuity or for as long as the project is not consistent with local zoning. Um, I, I think that 40 years seems like a long time, but at some point, you know, you will get to that. And the last thing that the, the city is going to want is the potential for an expiring affordability. So my recommendation would be that the board not agree to this change and keep the affordability as in perpetuity. So it, we are approving this with the intention of increasing our affordable housing, available affordable housing units to meet the state requirement of the 10%, which is the reason for the application through a 40B application. Am I correct in that? And that's if that's, correct. And so if that's the case, then I think I do not see the 10% affordability act from the state going away whether it's in 10 years 20 years or 40 years so i think the last thing we want to do is be taking affordable units off the off the uh available uh 10 does that yep does that make sense and what we're saying there yeah. so i i am uh i am in favor of keeping this in perpetuity in perpetuity as it is written in this decision. I agree. I agree. Fine with that. Okay. So with that, we will continue. The applicant shall maintain approval by the subsidizing agency of the affirmative fair housing market plan, AFHMP, prior to the rental of any affordable units and shall ensure that the project complies with the subsidizing agency's fair housing requirements. For the initial rent up of the project, the maximum number of affordable units allowed by law and the applicable subsidy program, but not more than 70% of the affordable units shall be reserved for households that qualify under the local preference definition approved by the subsidizing agency. A lottery shall be established in a form approved by the subsidizing agency and or the project's monitoring agency to 
effectuate this local preference with an approved secondary lottery for all other applicants. The applicant shall assist the city in the submittal of any evidence required by the subsidizing agency to support this local preference requirement. The board acknowledges that it will be required to provide evidence satisfactory to the subsidizing agency of the need for the foregoing local preference and to obtain approval by the categories of the persons qualifying for the same. And in no event shall the applicant be in violation of the terms of the comprehensive permit to the extent that the subsidizing agency disapproves the local preference requirements or any aspect thereof. The applicant shall provide reasonable and timely assistance to the city in providing this evidence. If the board or its designee does not provide such information within 60 days of the written request by the law applicant, it's a lottery agent, the subsidizing agency, then the condition shall be void unless the applicant has failed to provide reasonable and timely assistance as described above. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, so, Paul, is for local preference definition, is there an established definition or do we have to define that we mean within our municipality? Oh, you're muted, Paul. Sorry. The, the problem is if you try to uh, dictate the terms of the local preference, you might run into problem with the subsidizing agency. I would leave it to whatever terms that they allow for local preference. So, so you should be able to have that set up through the, the process of approval of the local preference. And, and the definition of local preference, is that a mileage? Is that a municipality? Do we know? When you mean who gets to define what local preference is? Yes. Again, the, the subsidizing agency, which is the entity that is ensuring compliance with fair housing requirements, gets to determine what local preference is. And they get to determine whether or not you get to um, include a local preference or you know whether you can't include a local preference it's it's solely within the discretion of the subsidizing agency okay submission requirements prior to any construction or site development activities including site clearing tree removal grading etc on the property whether or not pursuant to a building permit except as allowed by the city planner as noted below, the applicant shall A, deliver to the board a check in a reasonable amount determined by the city planner to be used for staff to retain outside experts, if necessary for technical reviews and inspections required under these conditions, but at, but at inception shall not exceed $6,500 unless an alternate amount has been agreed upon by the board and the applicant. Said funds shall be deposited by the board in an account pursuant to general law 4453G and shall only be used for technical reviews and inspections associated with this project. Any unspent funds shall be returned to the applicant with the accrued interest at the completion of the project. If at any time the board reasonably determines that there are insufficient funds to cover the cost of technical reviews, it shall inform the applicant and the applicant shall forthwith deliver additional funds as specified by the board in a reasonable amount as may be determined by the board. Said funds may be used by the board to hire civil engineering, traffic engineering, and or other professionals that the board deems necessary, reasonably necessary to ensure compliance with the conditions hereof. Obtain and file a copy of the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, NPDES permit, with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency if necessary. The board shall also provi be provided with a copy of the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan submitted along with the NPDES filing. Submit to the board for review and administrative approval final engineering drawings and, and plans, such plans to be that the plans conform to the requirements of the comprehensive permit and incorporate the conditions herein. The final plans shall also incorporate all conditions and requirements of permitting agencies having jurisdiction. 
Applicable sheets of the final plan shall be signed and sealed by a professional land surveyor of record, the professional civil engineer of record, the registered landscape architect. Final architectural plan shall be stamped by a registered architect. The final plan shall be submitted to the board at least 45 days prior to the anticipated date of commencement of building construction or submission of the application for building permits, whichever is earlier. Submit to the board for the administrative approval a landscaping plan with the final plan signed and sealed by registered landscape architect, architect depicting the following. Overall planting plan that includes the demarcation of clearing and the limits of work. Planting plans for drives showing shade trees and existing fixture locations, lighting fixtures locations. Plans of the walkways and open space and recreation areas. A question before we turn the page. Yes. Sir. At what point do we make mention of the sewer connection? Would that be part of C here in the plan design? Or is there somewhere else if we're specifying the if it's you know, the um, sewer connection like Mr. Nottleman said? There will be a section on sewer. Uh, There's project and design and construction. Okay. I'd say that's under E. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, no, I appreciate it. Um, prototype planting plans for each building that include shade trees, minimum caliber of two inches, ornamental trees, minimum caliber of two inches, and shrubs and ground covers. Prototype screening plans for dumpsters depicting plants and fencing. Planting details for coniferous and deciduous shade trees, minimum caliber of two inches, ornamental trees, minimum caliber of two inches, and shrubs. Planting schedules listing the quantity, size, height, caliper, species, variety, and form of trees, shrubs, and ground covers. Tree protection and preservation plans. Construction fencing along abutting property lines and construction details. All planting shall consist of non-invasive drought tolerant species. Plantings installed along drives and walkways shall also be salt tolerant. The final landscaping plans shall preserve the existing perimeter tree cover to the greatest extent possible. 12 months after completion of the plantings, the applicant shall remove and replace any dead or diseased plants, plantings and trees serving as screening. The contract with the management company shall address ongoing maintenance of landscaping features. Submit to the city planner a construction mitigation plan, including but not limited to dust control measures, fill delivery schedules, stockpiling areas, and the like matters. Other than site plan and such work as may be authorized in writing by the city planner, no other construction units shall commence and no building permit shall be issued under this comprehensive permit until the building commissioner and the other applicable staff have approved the final plans as the building as being in conformance with the decision. If no written response or comments have been given to the applicant by the building commissioner or other applicable city staff concerning the final site plans within 45 days after the final site plan submission date, the final plans as delivered will be deemed to be approved. Okay. Make sure I'm in the right place. Yeah. Uh, the applicant must provide notification to the city of East Hampton's assessor's office to address for address and unit numbering. Take a turn. Sure. Prior to the issuance of any building permits, the applicant shall record this comprehensive permit and the subdivision plan endorsed by the board with the Hampshire Registry of Deed at the applicant's expense and provide proof of such recording with the board. Submit to the board and the city planner evidence of final approval from the subsidizing agency EOHLC as required by the project eligibility letter and chapter 40B regulations. Submit to the board a copy of the regulatory agreement and monitoring services agreement per phase for the project. Execution and recording of such regulatory agreement with the EOHLC shall be completed prior to the issuance of any building permit. It is understood and agreed that monitoring provisions may be included with the regulatory agreement in lieu of a separate monitoring services agreement. 
Submit to the building commissioner final architectural plans prepared, signed, and sealed by an architect with a valid registration in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts architectural plans. The architectural plan shall be submitted in such form as the building commissioner may request pursuant to state building code. An automatic sprinkler system conforming with NFPA 13 or NFPA 13R as allowable by Massachusetts State Building and Massachusetts Comprehensive Fire Code 527 CMR 1.00. Fire alarm system conforming to NFPA 72 shall be required in all residential buildings. Fire alarm system shall be monitored by a UL approved central station monitoring service. Obtain and file with the building commissioner copy of all required federal, state, and local permits and approvals required to begin construction of the project. Submit all necessary electrical, plumbing, and associated permit applications required to begin construction of the project as required by state law. The applicant will be responsible for all sewer permit capacity impacts and privilege fees as applicable except as we herein. The applicant will be responsible for all applicable water and sewer system fees as per officially promulgated fee schedules uniformly applicable to all other City of East Hampton projects except as expressly waived herein. D, construction completion certificate of occupancy. Prior to issuance of certificate of occupancy for any structure in the project, the applicant shall submit engineers interim certification of compliance with utilities plan and profiles for such phase as applicable to the building commissioner. Provide a letter to the board signed by the applicant civil engineer certifying that the structure and supporting infrastructure has been constructed in compliance with the final plans in all material respects. Obtain acceptance from the East Hampton Fire Department of testing of all fire protection systems, fire alarm systems, fire sprinkler systems, and local smoke alarms within dwelling units of the structure. Obtain a sewer connection sign off from the East Hampton Sewer Commission for the structure. So is that where we want to address it or do we want to address it in the design? Or right before that. What's that? <clears throat> or the part that we just went over in the uh, uh, no, I think I think that I think we put it under E. Yeah, E because there's other uh applicant DPW things like that. So we're gonna go in E or e. so how are we looking toward this? We're gonna we're gonna put the sewer connection in E. Okay. So the in product is yeah, to get that. Um, D two prior to issuance of the certificate of occupancy for the first residential building to be constructed in each phase, the applicant shall submit to the board in digital file format and full size paper copies a final as built plan including profiles showing actual in in-ground installation of all federal utilities, rim and invert elevations, roadway, sidewalk, and associated construction. The file format shall be an AutoCAD file delivery, shall be in full model view and individual street views. The digital file shall include property boundaries, dimensions, easements, rights of way, edge of pavement, edge of sidewalk, edge of water bodies, wetland boundaries, topographic contours, spot elevations, parking areas, road center line, and associated text. Said digital data shall be delivered in the Massachusetts State Plain Coordinate System, North American Data 1983, North American Vertical Data 1988, in U.S. Survey Feet. The applicant shall provide to the board evidence of a property management plan, if the property management will be done in house, or shall provide a copy of a contract with a management company if the property management will be conducted by a third party. The applicant shall submit to the board all information relating to the issues of building security, public access, pet policy, staffing trash removal and smoking policies and other issues addressed in the conditions herein section eight project design and construction prior to the commencement of any work on the property the applicant and the site general contractor shall attend a pre-construction conference with the east hampton fire department east hampton water and sewer department city planner conservation agent building commissioner and other city staff and consultants as may be determined the applicant shall permit representatives of the board to observe and inspect the property construction progress until such time as the project has been completed and final occupancy permit, permit has been issued. All observations shall be made in accordance with the contractor and owner's site specific safety plan. The proposed construction shall be in accordance with the applicable federal 
state laws, rules, and regulations. All site retaining walls four feet or greater shall in height shall be designed by a Massachusetts professional structural engineer. During construction, the applicant shall conform to all local, state, and federal laws regarding noise, vibration, dust, and blocking of city roads. The applicant shall at times use all reasonable means to minimize inconvenience to residents in the general area. Adequate provisions shall be made by the applicant to control and minimize dust on the site during construction in accordance with the construction mitigation plan. Applicants shall keep all portions of any public way uses access egress to the project free of soil or debris deposited due to use by construction vehicles associated with the project. Appropriate signage shall be shown on the final plans. No waiver of signage requirements is requested. If the applicant subsequently determines a waiver is necessary, shall seek a modification of this permit pursuant to 760CMR56.0511. The location of all utilities, including but limited to electric, telephone, and cable, shall be shown on final plans. All transformers and other electric and telecommunication system components shall be included in final plans. Okay, I think we want to put it in here because that's where we've addressed utilities. So can we add under E.7 the connection of the sewer shall be made to the 8-inch main on Wilmelco Way? And, uh, I'll just create that as a new bullet point, and all the other things will shift up. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. The applicant proposes to use electric heat for the new construction buildings in the project. The applicant shall install lighting on the site that conforms to the City of East Hampton zoning bylaw. Lighting shall be downlit shielded to prevent light spillover onto surrounding properties. Management of outdoor lighting shall be the responsibility of the applicant. Utilities including but not limited to telephone, electric, and cable shall be located underground. Contract with management company shall note that no satellite dishes shall be allowed. Soil material uses backfill for pipes, access drives, and structures shall be certified by the geotechnical engineer or third party special inspector to building commissioner as meeting design specifications as applicable. Tonight, a, a quick point of order. I'm going back a couple of times when we talked about cable. Now with the um, fiber optics coming in, should we understand that cable includes that? Or should we also mention fiber optics? That is all, I think that falls all under our utilities. But we're citing the word cable. Including but not limited to. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, not limited to. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, the applicant shall test the soil during construction to, conforms, to confirm soil types in the areas of the infiltration system. Such testing shall be witnessed by the Department of Public Works. All unsuitable material, if any discovered in excavation for the infiltration system, shall be removed and disposed in accordance with state and local regulations. Construction activities will be, shall be conducted between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. on Saturdays. The purposes of condition, construction activities shall be defined as startup of equipment or machinery, delivery of building materials and supplies, delivery or removal of equipment or machinery, removal of trees, grubbing, clearing, grading, filling, excavating, import or export of earth materials, installation of utilities both on and off site, removal of stumps and debris, loading of construction dumpsters and erection of new structures. All off-site utility work shall be coordinated and approved by the building department and shall not be subject to the timing restrictions set forth above. Parking of all vehicles and equipment must be on the property during construction. Burning or burial of construction or demolition debris on the site is strictly prohibited. All such materials are to be removed from the site in accordance with applicable law. During construction, the site shall be secured against unauthorized entry or vandalism by fencing or other appropriate means in all. Construction materials shall be stored or stockpiled in a safe manner. Any floodlights used during construction period shall be located and directed so as to prevent spillover or illumination on two adjacent properties. All construction activities are to be conducted in a workmanlike manner. No building area shall be left in an open, unstabilized condition longer than 60 days. Temporary stabilization shall be accompanied by hay bales, hay covering, or matting. Final stabilization shall be accomplished by loaming and seating exposed areas. All dumpsters serving the project shall be enclosed and covered, the exception of construction dumpsters used during construction. The board shall review dumpster locations as part of the final 
approval of final plans, if different from what is shown on the approved plans. All retaining walls visible from way or direct letters as determined by city plan are based upon time of the year when such walls are visible shall be constructed in a certain manner. Simply retaining walls which shall avoid the use of exposed concrete to the greatest extent practicable. Snow shall be stored within areas of the property designated on the approved plans. Snow storage areas shall be reviewed by the conservation agent as part of the review of final plans. To the extent that snowfall exceeds capacity of designated snow storage areas, the applicant shall truck the excess snow off site. Proof of notification of the snow rule to the snow rule contractor of the location of snow storage areas shall be provided to building commissioners. Do they have snow storage plans? Or is that not our purview? Was that Comscom? I don't remember seeing that anywhere. Um, it's a good question. What's that one? We talked about no plan removal. I think during the initial one, am I correct about that? It's been, I, I feel like it's been a while, a while since we were at that point. Yeah. Let's see if there's anybody here to speak on. Um, yeah, is there anyone here in the applicant here to speak concerning snow storage location? We haven't developed a plan specifically yet, but there will need to be one for Conservation Commission. So we will certainly have one as part of that. Act. And that will be part of the final plan? Yes, group. final plan set, yeah. Did you, we can put a line just in here for administrative approval as well, well that will come to the planning department. Again, the city planner sign off. Yes, please. Yeah. Got it. The applicant shall comply with all applicable state and federal requirements relating to noise from construction activities, including the regulations contained at 310 CMR 7.10 in the DEP's noise policy contained in the DAQC policy D-001. The applicant shall also implement all necessary controls to ensure that vibration from construction activities does not constitute a nuisance or hazard beyond the property. On notification from the Appropriate municipal officials, the applicant shall cease all construction activities creating noise in excess of state and federal standards and shall implement such mitigation measures as necessary to ensure the construction activity will comply with applicable state and federal requirements. The applicant is responsible for sweeping, removal, and sanding of internal roadways, driveways, entryways, and sidewalks, providing access to both the residents of the project and emergency vehicles. The applicant shall maintain all portions of any public road, whether state or local roads, used for access to property by construction vehicles to the degree reasonably possible, free from soil, mud, or debris deposited due to such use during the duration of construction. The applicant shall comply with DPW requirements regarding curb cut permits, and shall obtain a state highway access permit as necessary from Mass DOT. To the extent earth removal, meaning Moving earth off site is necessary. The applicant shall prepare an earth removal plan showing all necessary cuts and fills for such off site removal and describing a good faith estimate of the number of truck trips necessary for the removal. All catch basins shall have oil water separators as shown on the approved plans. Project sidewalks and pathways walkways shall be compliant with the requirements of the American Disabilities Act. ADA and the requirements of the Architectural Access Board, AAB. Sufficient information regarding grading shall be included in the final plans to allow for determination of compliance with ADA and AAB requirements. This conference of permit shall be a master permit, which is issued in lieu of all other local permits or approvals that would otherwise be required, except for the issuance of building permits and certificates of occupancy by the building department under the state building code provided. However, the applicant shall pay all local fees for such permits or approvals as published in the department regulations or bylaws, including that limit to building permits, inspections, water and sewer connections, and curb cuts. Okay. No break. You want to take a break? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. I'll carry on. <clears throat> F. Traffic, traffic safety conditions, sidewalks. The applicant shall ensure that emergency vehicles can adequately maneuver through the site. The East Hampton Fire Department shall review the final plans to ensure compliance with this condition. Two. The applicant shall. Supply detailed grading information as part of the final plans to ensure that all accessible parking, walkways, and building entrances will comply with applicable Architectural Access Board and Americans with Disabilities Act requirements. 
The applicant shall provide surety for the co completion of project infrastructure consistent with general law 4181U. The surety shall be kept in place and shall be automatically renewed until such time as construction of the aforesaid driveway and related infrastructure is complete, completed and funds are released. The bond amount shall be calculated using the standard myth, method, methodology myth, sorry, established by the East Hampton Planning Board for subdivisions. Police, fire, and emergency medical conditions. The applicant shall provide professional property management and maintenance personnel on the premises during normal daytime hours and an emergency contact name at number for tenants in the East Hampton Fire Department and Police Department and Fire Department. The applicant will provide Knox boxes for all buildings for police department and fire department. The applicant will work with the fire department to ensure access during construction. Stairwells and garages must be rated in accordance with the requirements of the Massachusetts State Building Code. Residential units must be one what must be one hour fire related. The residual structure will be fully sprinkled, sprinklered to NFPA 13 regulations, mm -hmm. compliance with all state building code and NFPA 13 requirements relating to fire access and safety shall be met. All ele elevators must be connected to standby power either through the uninterrupted power supply or backup generator where required by the Massachusetts State Building Code. The project shall maintain on-foot firefighter access to all four sides of each residential structure at all times and shall maintain emergency vehicle access at all times as required by the State Building in Massachusetts Comprehensive Fire Code 527 CMR 1.00. The project shall provide adequate external lighting to ensure safety of the residents of the project. During times of construction, the project, including all structures, shall be accessible to fire department and other emergency vehicles. Additionally, all hydrants shall be operated, shall be operational during construction in accordance with the NFPA 13 requirements. Standpipes shall be operational on each floor during construction as required by the building code in the East Hampton Fire Department. The applicant shall consult with the fire department prior to the commencement of construction to provide an on-site emergency plan, which shall be updated as necessary throughout the construction process. Water, sewer, and utilities. The applicant shall be responsible for the design and installation of utilities servicing the project. All water and sewer infrastructure shall be installed in conformance with the East Hampton Water and Sewer Department's technical requirements. The applicant shall consult with East Hampton Water and Sewer Department prior to the commencement of the construction. I just want to hold up there, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking now that we want to put the our commentary concerning the sewer connection down here in H. Yeah. Rather. Is that the preference of the board? I can do that? Yes. The, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, fire hydrants shall be placed as shown on the approval plans and locations approved by East Hampton Fire Department and the East Hampton Water Department. The East Hampton Fire Department approves different hydrant, hydrant locations. Such modifications shall be accepted as an insubstantial change pursuant to 760 CMR 56.0511. The service size for the domestic water service should be verified by the East Hampton Water and Sewer Department, and information on the fire service size and requirements should be verified by the East Hampton Fire Department. Mm -hmm. The applicant shall submit in information regarding the size of both the domestic and fire services as part of the final plans after construction with the East Hampton Water and Sewer Department. After consultation with the East Hampton Water and Sewer Department. <clears throat> the water and sewer utilities servicing the buildings in the project shall be installed and tested in accordance with the applicable city requirements and protocols, except as may be waived herein. Utilities shall be installed underground by the applicant using methods standard to those installations. Utilities shall be defined as electric service lines, telephone lines, water service lines, CATV lines, municipal conduit, and the like. <clears throat> the applicant shall be responsible for all trash and recycling removal from the property. The requirement for trash and recycle, recycling removal shall be the responsibly, responsibility of the applicant and or its management company and shall not be the responsibility of the tenants of the project. The City of East Hampton shall not have any responsibility for trash and recycling pickup at the property. Fire hydrants shall remain private 
and shall be maintained by the applicant. <laughs> Wetlands, environmental stormwater conditions. The applicant proposes work within the 100, 100 foot buffer zone to a bordering vegetative wetland. The applicant will require will be required to obtain an order of conditions from the East Hampton Conservation Commission under the State Wetlands Protection Act or a superseding order of conditions from the Department of Environmental Protection. No structure requiring a building permit, including but not limited to dwellings, garages, storage sheds, or swimming pools shall be installed or constructed within 42 feet of any resource area. No stormwater infrastructure shall be infrastructure shall be installed or constructed within 10 foot within 10 feet of any resource area and no grading shall take place within one foot of any resource area. Josh, I think you missed I2. Is, is your is that one you read I2 for you? Yeah, I do. No. I was reading from the first one. Oh, okay. oh so, yeah, that's this is the new one that was okay. added on after uh, our discussion last week. You want me to read it? I'll just put it in there. The applicant must receive, review, and approve an approval from the Conservation Commission for the Stormwater Management Plan. Any changes from the plans presented as part of this, this application shall be reviewed by the ZBA at a public meeting. Okay, I'm just going to pull up the new one quickly. Yeah. So we're reading for the same one. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> no structure requiring a building permit, including, and I just read that one, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. fertilizers utilized for landscaping and lawn care shall be flow release, low nitrogen, less than 5%, and phosphorus free pipes, and shall not be used within 25 feet of, the res of a resource area. Pesticides and herbicides shall not be used within 100 feet of a wetland resource area. This condition shall survive this order of conditions and shall run with the title of the property. There shall be no dumping of leaves, grass clippings, brush, or other debris into a wetland resource area or associated buffer zones. Dumping of snow into wetland resource areas is also prohibited. <clears throat> Only non-sodium de-icing compounds are to be used within wetland resource areas and or buffer zones, including calcium chloride or calcium magnesium acetate. De-icing compounds shall be stored in sheltered areas on impervious pads. Any arrangement for snow removal shall stipulate these conditions. <laughs> All work shall be conducted in accordance with the approval, approved erosion and sediment, sedimentation control plan. Within one week of final grading, weather permitting, all disturbed areas, all, all disturbed areas located within wetland resources areas, buffer zones shall be stabilized against erosion. This shall be done either by sodding or by loaming, seeing, seeding, and mulching. Should that be seeding or seeing? Seeding. Okay, it says seeing. Seeding and mulching according to Soil Conservation Service standards and the approved way. <clears throat> Stabilization will be completed when the surface snow shows completed vegetated cover. Temporary stabilization measures approved by the board's inspection engineer will be required should work be interrupted for more than 10 days. The applicant or, or a sign shall ensure the cleanliness of all catch basins and roadway affecting by the project related activity. All catch basins will be protected by silt bag inlet protection device or equal during the pro pro project work period. The applicant shall inspect and clean as necessary all catch basins and sweep the road, roadway at least weekly during construction. They may be required more frequently during rain events. There shall be no sedimentation in wetlands or water bodies from discharge pipes or surface runoff leaving the property. The board or its agent, which may be the cons conservation, cons conservation commission agent acting on behalf of the board, shall have the right to enter the property for inspections and to evaluate compliance with the wetlands conditions contained herein upon reasonable notice of not less than 24 hours. Access shall be allowed in without the need for advance notice in emergency situations when necessary to prevent imminent harm to wetlands resource areas. 
The applicant shall follow all requirements, permits, and directives issued by the Commonwealth of Mass Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, NHESP, as applicable. During and after work on this project, there shall be no discharge of spillage or fuel or other pollutants into wetland resource area. If there is a spill or discharge of any pollutant during any phase of construction, the commission shall be notified by the applicant within one business day. The construction vehicles, construction vehicles are to be stored within 100 feet of wetland resource areas overnight, and no vehicle refueling, equipment lubrication, or maintenance is to be done within 100 feet of a resource area. Prior to any work commencing on site, the applicant shall submit to the board proof that a self-verification notification form has been submitted to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers if required. <clears throat> Prior to any work commencing on site, the applicant shall submit to the board proof the NPDES stormwater permit is active for the project if required. Copies of all information and all required reports regarding the U.S. EPA and NPDES permit and stormwater pollutant prevention plans SWPPP, if required, shall be forwarded to, the, forwarded to the board as both a paper and electronic copy. The applicant shall provide a percolation test prior to the issuance of building permits to confirm the infiltration rate for the proposed stormwater management system. I just to clarify, so most of this is all Conservation Commission, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yes, everything like referring to them verifying that surface runoff yep. is not going to be leaving the site yep. and all the language about setbacks and everything yep okay thank you <clears throat> other general conditions this decision will be deemed to be final upon the expiration of the appeal period with no appeal having been filed or upon the final ju judicial decision following the filing of any appeal whichever is later as per 760 cmr 5605 12 a in accordance with 760 CMR 560512C, this comprehensive permit shall expire three years from the date that the permit becomes final, unless one prior to that time construction authorized by the comprehensive permit has commenced or two period is otherwise told in accordance with the law. The applicant may timely apply to the board for extensions to the comprehensive permit as permitted by law. The applicant shall comply with all local regulations to the city and its boards, commissions, and departments unless specifically waived herein or is otherwise addressed in these conditions. The applicant shall copy the board on all correspondence between the applicant and any federal, state, or city official, board, or commission concerning the conditions set for in this decision, including but not limited to all testing results, official filings, environmental approvals, and other permits issued by the project. This decision prohibits parking or storage of any unregistered vehicle on the site, and likewise prohibits the service of any vehicle on the site except during construction. <clears throat> In the event that the applicant or its management company fails to maintain the stormwater management system for the project in accordance with its operation maintenance plan, within 14 days of notification by the city to the applicant management company, the city may conduct emergency maintenance and or repair as it deems necessary. And the applicant shall, prior to the issuance of any certificates of occupancy, convey such easement in other rights in a form mutually accepted to the acceptable to the city and the applicant as may be reasonably necessary to complete such repair and or maintenance. In, in the event the city is required to perform such maintenance, the applicant shall reimburse the city within 45 days for all its reasonable expenses related to such work. The project entranceway, driveway, and drainage systems associated therewith shall be remain private, and the city shall not have any legal responsibility for the operation and maintain, maintenance of such. The city shall also have no obligations relating to any proposed recreational areas on the property, the construction and operation of which shall be the sole responsibility of the applicant. If any default or violation or breach of these conditions by the applicant is not cured within 30 days after notice thereof, or such longer period as time is reasonably necessary to cure such a default so long as the applicant is diligently and continuously prosecuting such a cure, then the city may take one or more of the following steps. A, enforcement by the zoning enforcement officer pursuant to general law C40A7. B, 
by mandamus or other suit action or other proceeding at law or in equity requiring the applicant to perform obligations under these conditions, or C, take such other action at law or in equity as may appear necessary or desirable to enforce these conditions. If the city brings any claim to enforce these conditions and the city finally prevails in such a claim, the applicant shall reimburse the city for its reasonable attorney's fees and expenses incurred in connection with such claim. Each residential building shall provide laundry facilities as shown on approval plans. Uh, decision, in consideration of all the foregoing, including the plans, documents, and testimony given during the public hearing, the board hereby grants the applicant a comprehensive permit for the construction of 127 mid-rental apartment units pursuant to Chapter 40B, 2023, for the development described above. All right. Um, so there are a couple of notes. We just want to read those over before we then have public here, public speak, and the voting. Before we move on, Mr. Chair, uh, you yeah. want to just run through the decision of waivers. Well, yeah, that was the that's that section I was saying. Oh, okay, fantastic. Okay. Uh, yes. Oh, decision on waivers. Uh, the board takes the following action on the waivers request for the local law of rules and regulations submitted by the applicant as it was determined necessary for the construction of the project as approved by the board. In its preliminary statement, the applicant requests waivers from otherwise applicable building permit and water department fees as the affordable units. Since all of the units of the project proposed to be affordable, the waivers to seek this waiver seeks a waiver of all building permits and building. That seems repetitive. And so the applicant seeks a waiver. And yet there's no decision. We have not made a decision on that, and there's no number on that. Um, I think that's just a, or is that just a general, general statement? Yeah. Okay. That was just a general statement. There. Okay. Uh, number one, uh, zoning ordinance, uh, section six to six one. This section requires a minimum lot size for multifamily dwellings with at least 15% affordable units to be at least 25,000 square feet per unit. The applicant proposes 4,882 square feet per unit. The applicant requests a waiver to allow the project to be approved as shown on the approved plans. The board is, we've discussed this and we're willing to grant that waiver. Zoning ordinance section. Before you move on, can I just go back to the um, the preliminary statement on the waivers? Yes. I just wanted to clarify uh, exactly what that meant. So it says in his preliminary statement, the applicant requests waivers from otherwise applicable building permit and water department fees as to the affordable units. But the proposal is that all of the units would be affordable. So it would in effect be a waiver of all building permit and water department fees. So that's what I was trying to get across there. Okay. And and, and I think we cover that in question eight. Yes, correct. In, in board action, uh, board decision number eight. Okay. Correct. Yep. All right. I just want to thank you for that clarification. So number two, zoning ordinance section 462. This section requires a maximum building height of 40 feet. The applicant seeks a waiver to allow a maximum building height of 41 feet, three inches. Um, and that's been reviewed and granted. Zoning Ordinance 4-8.32C3.5.4. This section sets a maximum number of dwelling units per structure at 18. The applicant seeks a waiver to allow the project as proposed containing 40 units in one structure and 29 units in the three other structures. It's my understanding the 40 units is the existing unit and the 29 are the three proposed new units. And that is granted. 
Uh, number four, zoning ordinance section eight, 8.334C. This section limits the number of parking spaces per parking area to no, not more than 14 spaces. The applicant requests a waiver to allow the parking areas to contain 23 spaces, 25 spaces, and 22 spaces. The applicant notes that there is an existing parking area containing 44, 42 spaces. So the new spaces would not be in excess of the existing. And granted. Uh, number five, zoning ordinance 10.3. This section requires 1.5 parking spaces per unit for multifamily housing with 15% affordable units. The applicant proposes 0.78 parking units, uh, parking spaces per unit. And that is also agreed. Section 4000, that's a new one on me, uh, site plan review. And this section requires site plan review from the planning board for certain development projects. The applicant requests a waiver from the procedural requirements to obtain a site plan approval. Uh, the waiver was denied as unnecessary pursuant to this Mass General Law 40B 20-23, a comprehensive permit subsumes all local permitting requirements, therefore applicant is not required to obtain a site plan review. Water and Sewer Board, the applicant requests any permits or approvals required to connect to the municipal water system and municipal sewer system be waived in favor of the board granting such special permits. This waiver was denied as unnecessary. Pursuant Mass General Law 40B 20-23, all comprehensive permits subsumes all local permitting requirements. Therefore, the applicant is not enough required to obtain separate approval to connect to the most municipal water and sewer systems. And municipal fees, the applicant requests a waiver of all municipal fees for construction of permit. This action was denied at the recommendation of DPW director. The board believes the city shall not bear the cost of connections for municipal systems and or construction fees. I want to add and or construction fees to that. Um, so now my question is, is, we did add a statement under the water and sewer that the connection should be made to the eight inch line and one way do we also want to stipulate that again in this or is this just waivers is this just waivers so it shouldn't be never mind i answered my own question yep <laughs> just speaking it out loud so we all understand okay so we have read the entire decision as presented uh, thank you uh mr haverty for an incredible job there uh, thank you one all for reading. Um, at this point, we will ask if there's anyone in the public who has any common, additional commentary or questions or concerns, they may come forward. I will ask that you state your name, your address for the record. We also ask that any additional, that any subsequent questions be new in relative, and even today, new and relative to where we are that we don't continue to dwell on any conversations previously discussed. And, uh, Mr. Chair, the applicant had a question. Oh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, very difficult to have Sorry to go back, <laughs> um, but if we could go back to page 13, uh, section C2. C? Okay. Section C2. Yes, C2C? Uh, yes. Okay. So this has to do with the submission of the recorded EOHLC re affordability regulatory agreement and the relationship between when we submit that and the issuance of the city's building permit. So um, just to explain the way the sequencing works on these kinds of projects, we have a lot of uh, folks, the state funders and uh, the city involved in the uh, financial initial construction loan closing of a project. That regulatory agreement what we propose is that we submit a draft of that um, that as prepared by EOHLC to um, the uh, VBA. Um, it actually can't get recorded. The sequencing is we need the building permit in order to close on the financing. And then immediately when we close on the financing, all the documents, the deed, everything gets recorded. So the regulatory agreement would then be recorded and then we can submit the recorded copy to the board. So that would be our request for that item. 
Mr. Haverty, you have the expert uh, on this. <laughs> I have run into this in the past. Um, I think you know frequently a building department will be willing to issue a building permit to be held in escrow by the building department until all of the regulatory um, requirements have been completed because it does get to be a little bit of a chicken or the egg issue there. Um, but technically you're not supposed to be issuing building permits until final approval has been issued and those regulatory documents are part of the final approval process. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Mr. Freeman. Uh, yes, Peter Freeman for the applicant. Um, I agree with what uh, Paul just said. You know, often I put in language sort of a caveat after your condition provided. However, it is understood that because the regulatory agreement is not recorded until the closing, that uh, it is sufficient if the building commissioner issues a will issue building permit letter stating that it will issue upon recording of the regulatory agreement. Yeah, that, and that's fine. Okay. So, so a basically a, a letter from the building commissioner saying that a, a permit will be issued, and that will allow for the fund the financing to get and the regulatory agency to go ahead and close their portion, and then we can go ahead and proceed. Right. Yes. So we'll uh, clean up that language and get that right, and then that signed off from everybody, and then you folks will have final approval of that language okay. before you sign. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. Since my client brought that point, uh, and thank you, Julia, um, before public comment, um, just something that uh, our team, uh, especially Mark from Kestrel, uh, caught. So in C1, C.1, subsection B, which is all the requirements for the landscaping plan, um, the suggestion is that we carve out the fact that that does not apply to the conservation land that will be owned by Kestrel because they will be subject to the conservation restriction, which spells out all those types of details and probably even more restrictive. So my suggestion is after the introduction, before it gets into the one, two, three, et cetera, if we just add provided, however, that this condition is not applicable to the Kestrel land trust conservation restriction parcel. Which uh, which page and which section? Uh, it's, it's page uh, on eleven, I believe it's eleven, but it's condition C point one D is in David. C one D. Bottom of page eleven. Yeah. So the so you're basically looking at sub permitting almost just the section for the construction of the three buildings and supporting infrastructure and not no. involving the mm -hmm. balance of the property no no i'm looking and mark and team correct me if i'm wrong but i'm looking at subsection d the one that says submit to the board for its administrative approval a landscaping plan with a final plans blah 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 depicting the following and then there's a voluminous list which is certainly fine as to the as to the housing portion of the property, um, but we don't think that it, you know, is applicable or should be applicable to the land trust area because that's going to be subject to its own restrictive covenant with great restrictions. Things separate. So I guess basically saying that this landscaping plan is just for whatever the law number is that is under development. Correct. Right. But it, right. It, and even even less than that, that only the portion that's being disturbed for the construction. But the balance well, we, don't, well, we don't need to make that. I'm fine with not making that further distinction. I mean, it is the development parcel for which there will be a landscaping plan with all those with all those details. It's just the non-development parcel, the Kestrel land trust parcel, where mm -hmm. um, I think it's a valid point that Mark raised that it doesn't need to have all those details uh, reviewed. It, it's it's not part of the developed area. Keep the conversation part. Conservation part separate. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, one thing we might want to be aware of, though, on that, um, and I, I know I think it's going to come up at some point with uh, talking to Mr. Walmsley about this. 
the parking, the public parking for the conservation land is going to be uh, right on somebody's abutting property line there. I know there's been a concern of screening there. So I guess the question there is how would we want to handle screening because I know there might be some concern, might be some changes with stormwater with what comes up at CONCOM. So we may want to have some type of condition here in here that we would still have screening because they might be removing shrubbery, maybe a fence would need to go in on that area, something like that that could change based on uh, what ComCom reviews. Maybe, maybe Mark, you could chime in here a little bit on this. Sure, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, th there is some nuance to work through here, and part of this is just the innovative nature of the project, not having done a uh, conservation area in coordination with an affordable housing development before. Um, kind of in a nutshell, yes, I, I think um, uh, Max is, or, or uh, Dylan is right, excuse me. Um, right at the entranceway, uh, there are going to be some elements that will be associated with the affordable housing construction. Um, some of the stormwater controls, um, some of the screening concerns will be at that entrance, and part of the entrance obviously will serve as emergency access to the uh, affordable housing units. Um, I'm more thinking ahead to uh, the back or the western part of the, conser parcel of the conservation land, where there will be uh, unpaved trails, potentially small agricultural structures, kiosks, and that type of thing. Um, those kind of take some time to kind of figure out how that property is going to be used. And I just want to make sure that we don't have to have all those nailed down in any sort of plan associated with the much bigger construction um, that we can kind of let that be more freeform and governed by the CR, uh, as Peter mentioned. Because um, uh, again, the CONCOM will be looking over and, and any changes there and making sure the CONCOM and the other CR holder, the primary CR holder, which will be mass Audubon. So I don't know the correct way to parse the terms there to kind of, you know, possibly exempt kind of that one entrance area or not, but um, yeah. Just set like a distance from the frontage so far deep in the lot. Currently there uh, is a plan that shows that access road and like a cul-de-sac at the end of it, uh, which which extends along the abutting property there as a separate lot. And I, I was wondering if what if we left that lot as subject to this review because it would cover the, the both the parking area, access road and the, the boundary and then the remaining back portion um, it, it would be yes, exactly. Do you see right there where yep. it kind of goes yep. that? What if that would be? Um, so if we limited it to this? Yes. You know, if, if the only thing that we could do, and I, you know, if you don't mind saying, I think it's parcel, the Fedor Drive parcel 154.32.2, um, where it is contiguous with parcel A. So exempt that little bulb at the end, because that's probably going to be a little bit of a trail hub back there. Um, so, so you're saying 31.1 and 31.2 would fall under this requirement, but 30. No, I, I was basically, yeah, well, definitely 31.1 would. Uh, 31.2 would up to the point where it is uh, contiguous with that lot one parcel A, which is 31.2, and leaving uh, out that, again, that bulb at the end, however we always want to call so that basically, out. basically, where if we were to play connect the dots, where 31.1 to the west, where it basically, where it would go up and hit that, that corner, that lot yep, corner. Yep, exactly, exactly. Everybody understand that. So I'm going to get four mm -hmm. set a distance, and we say so everything from that basically from the right is, away is subject to the plan. Yeah, yeah. So you could measure that. That would work. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? I mean, we know where that pinpoint is. We could say from that pinpoint to the corner lot. Make sure that we're all in agreement. Jeff, Jeff. Jeff. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, from this pinpoint to that corner lot. Sure. Yep. And everything. This is subject to the landscape requirements. The landscape requirements, and this all falls under CR. CR. Yep. I mean, and, and it also will all fall under CR as well. We can't exempt it from the CR, but uh, it will also have jurisdiction, I guess, under the 40B as well. Yeah, there's no way we could exclude that from the CR. 
So there'll be double uh, <laughs> double municipal input. <laughs> the, uh, well, I do know that I believe this is going to go for an ANR for the planning board to finally divide up these lots between the community builders and Casper Land Trust. So uh, maybe uh, the, the, oh, sorry, we have. Actually, Mr. Chairman, um, that's something I had discussed with Paul Haverty um, the other day, or maybe today. Um, actually, we don't, it is eligible for an A and R, um, but our expectation is, and there's actually something in the condition that says this, the plan will be endorsed by the zoning board, which you have the power to do under 40B. So it's in a later condition that says that the, the uh, uh, forget what else is supposed to be recorded. It may be where it says the regulatory agreement is to be recorded, but it also says what must be recorded is the plan endorsed by the zoning board of appeals by you folks and you know i was contemplating that we might make that more explicit and i would like to because there's really no reason to go to the planning board as paul has explained you know, this permit and your your board has the power to issue everything and it's very common it's not controversial in this case um so perhaps in that section which i don't have it right in front of me but we're talking we're about it's C to a yeah so then if we could add prior to saying shall record the um plan endorsed by the by the board if we add a statement that says the board shall endorse the the approved plan subdividing the property Okay. I feel like this is a, I know we added in findings about the easement and protected land, but I feel like this might be a spot to have a condition that the easement is recorded as well prior to building permit. Is that I think the it, way it compels it, it? If it's in here, because this is prior to issuance of any building permits, you know, they have to record it. So as long as we say we've, we've divided the property and they will record that division, that meets the requirement. Like, what is, is that, mandating uh, an easement on conservation easement on the property based on this though? We just subdivide. What what proof do we have that it's a conservation easement's been recorded? And we can stipulate that in there. So I'm, yeah, so I'm thinking that we sure. So we need verbiage that stipulates that the property will be divided and that the lot <laughs> Can't do that. What are the full size? On which page do we want this on? This is on C2 prior to that. It has to be recorded. Is that the correct place to put it there, Paul? Yeah, I think that's right. So, what I would suggest is adding a sentence at the end of c to a that would state the applicant shall submit a my lot to the board for endorsement as part of the submittal of final plans dividing the property as shown on the approved plans which the board shall then endorse yeah, that's fine all right, all right. Oh, this just a question on the timing on that the subdivision will need to happen will happen sooner than the submittal of final plans for the conservation restrictions be placed no, Ju julie that that that's that's separate i mean you can you can submit it anytime and then the board will sign it so that's fine that wording is perfect in fact right right yeah it doesn't limit it to final plans it's just by the by the filing of final plans you shall have done that but nothing prevents you from doing it sooner Great. Okay. Thank you. Apologies. Okay. Um, I just want to check in. It, it, it seemed like there was some talk about including reference to the conservation restriction in there. I just want to know that just because it is um, notoriously hard to time conservation restriction approval by the state. Um, it is under review right now, <laughs> but I, I don't want to, uh, I just want to make sure with my partners that, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to be in some way uh, impacting uh the 40b process by kind of tying that in um that is a requirement by our one of the grants that we're hoping to get we were awarded we just reapplied for it from the state so um the conservation restriction is uh moving forward but uh, again timing it is tough 
Yeah, I don't, I don't see any provision that requires, you know, any sort of timing as it relates to the conservation restriction. Okay, that would be good. Okay. Any other questions or concerns from the applicant? Nope, don't think so. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything, any other members of the applicant team would like to add before we move forward to the public? We're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we will go back to where we were with anyone from the public who has anything they would like to add that is new and relevant to where we stand today. Shall we discuss it from our seats? Uh, I would ask that you come up here so it's going to make life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, no redundancy. We've already gone over that. There again, state your name, address, please, for the record. Kathy Wazinski, Buffalo Drive. So I understand your request for no redundancy, but your findings of fact are not factual. So I think we do need to review them. Um, the number 13. And some of this is because we didn't get to do a full discussion when we were meeting last. Um, the board engaged in a review of potential civil engineering and site design. The fact that the, all of the issues with the stormwater plan were missed um, and they still exist um, leads me to believe that that actually isn't a finding of fact. Um, and number 19 still remains not accurate. The board. Um, the fact that the stormwater management plan has been designed in compliance with the mass stormwater management standards is still not correct. There isn't a stormwater plan as far as we've seen, and they can't design it with it with in compliance because they didn't do the testing between November and April as they were supposed to do. So this finding of fact can't be accurate because they didn't do the testing the one they were supposed to. So therefore, they can't yet design a stormwater management plan in compliance with the standards both for the state and the city. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, not to interrupt, but it may be easier point by point rather than, you know, having to note everything and maybe miss something. I think that the speaker is not seeing the most recent amendment because at my suggestion last hearing, uh, you were going to add, and I think you read it earlier, that you added that the applicants and engineer has represented that as to the stormwater. Um, so that's point one. And the other point is is as to, I think it was, um, uh, was it the, uh, finding of fact 13 that you referenced? Yes. Yes. Right, the board, I mean, that, I don't yeah. see. I don't. I don't see what's objectionable about that. Actually, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that it was. You know, we heard testimony that it was designed. It doesn't say that it was. It just says we heard testimony that it was. So what we know is that the the testimony specifically about the stormwater is not accurate. It's not designed in compliance. And, it can't be compliance because Mr. the test was not done during the specified time frame. We heard testimony. We agreed that the testimony that the that what was designed did not meet the current requirements and that they would have to come up with a final design. So currently your finding of fact says that the stormwater management plan has been designed in compliance with mass no. stormwater management standards. No it doesn't. No it says the testimony was heard that it was doesn't say that it was it says no, that it i'm was. reading from the recent no one. you're looking at the original he read it the chairman read it earlier it's changed i'm sorry i respect your comment but it, your concern is taken care of you're reading the previous draft that has the same language or testimony from the applicant okay so we're assuming that the applicant who already made the error is being truthful the, the error still exists. They can't fix the error because the testing hasn't been done. It can't be done during the time frame. November hasn't arrived. 
Mr. Chairman, but that's been addressed by the condition you added as to the Conservation Commission review. So the speaker's points have been heard and understood and well taken at the last Lord, again, which keeps Change, happening. And the changes and the changes address, I didn't address interrupt them. you were speaking, sir. No, you interrupted me just now. The condition right. that you All right. comes later solves it for so you. We then okay. need to then go to the sewer issue. There is no plan that has been proposed yet as how we're going to get to the Wamilka Way. I'm assuming there's going to need to be some easement. What happens if that plan doesn't fall through? Are we then going to connect to Main Street in an appropriate way? The condition way? is that they will connect to the Wamilka Way. Okay. That's the way the decision is written. Typically, those plans should be provided as part of this, this process. There's no mm -hmm. way to review the process. They, they will be reviewed by the city building inspector, by the uh, water and sewer department. Without public comment. Most things on public sewers are done without public comment, yes. But typically in these processes, basic plans need to be available. And there is no basic plan for the sewer connection at this moment. There doesn't need to be. There, it, it, it's, it's a public utility that needs to meet the requirements of the city codes and state codes. That's... Typically those That's things... Right. All of that. Your, what's your, your take on that? So on Chapter 40B, an applicant is only required to submit preliminary plans. The plans that have been submitted comply with that requirement. Final detail plans are generally provided as part of the submittal of the final plans. But the preliminary plans include connection to Main Street, so they're, they're not and, accurate. And it was determined that it wouldn't it's not what we want to do we've discussed it with the city engineers they've said that we're going to connect to the city line. engineer is not a licensed engineer so i can guarantee you that the submission final submission as required in the findings that says i, I can see that you're not going to listen to anything we have to say there's no point we'll just appeal <laughs> anyone else is there anyone else who has anything they'd like to add before the board makes a decision? Yes, sir. I'm Ken Best. We talked about some things last week, and I don't know, I keep touching, touching over them again, but it seems like you haven't addressed the problem, uh, and I just want to make sure that somebody addresses it because just because someone that the, the people that are building says it's okay and they hire someone that they know to do it and they get them to say what they want doesn't necessarily mean it's right specifically the, tra the traffic that i talked to you about last week i don't want to keep going over it but i think that ought to be done by some some of one of us one of the board someone that has that's not connected to them to do a traffic study and maybe get the state involved and say we want to put traffic back somewhere like it's a big y or something like that to slow down traffic a little bit and, it does, and I don't, I didn't hear in your discussions where it was actually discussed other than the fact that you said there was considerable input from people. And I just, I just think that the considerable input means that we're concerned. And I know you guys are, are, are volunteers and you're doing a hell of a job. I could never do what you're doing. So there are some things that are sticking in my head and that's, that's one of them. And if it's not going to be addressed, I have a problem with it. So that's what I want to hear is the answer as to what you're going to do about it. I mean, I know what it says in your paper, and I heard you read them. But I want to know what you're all going to do about it. Are you going to look into it at all, or is it just going to say, well, they said it's okay, so it's okay? You know what I mean? The challenge that we run into is that the road that they're accessing is a state highway. I know. Um, and I think that, Mr. Nuttleman, you may be able to speak to this better than I can, in that the requirements of trying to get any sort of traffic controls on a state highway are probably more difficult than anything that anybody on this board would like to challenge and we can't and we can't yeah and and but yeah you know, greg do you have anything you can add to by way of traffic controls on a state highway uh no with that area being uh under the jurisdiction of mass dot we we, we wouldn't look uh take much of a look at it as the department of public works we don't have any jurisdiction basically any jurisdiction over it 
So if we have concerns, shouldn't they be applying to the state for to have someone to come down and look at that road? Yep, and I believe once this process gets to that point, that that would happen. Yeah, the the applicant needs to ask. They need to get permission to put access onto the state highway. Yes, the, the entire permitting process will happen through Mass DOT, the state highway access permit. And at which point they will also review the traffic study that was completed, and will look for potentially further downstream than just what they have to do. Okay. And, and that is addressed in condition E22, which requires them to obtain a state highway access permit. All right, how's fun day? I do a couple other things, just bear with me a second. Um, traffic, you're gonna have 100 people living over there and they're gonna be walking over to the big Y. Maybe some of them will drive, they may, they may not all have cars. How are they gonna get there? There's no sidewalks anywhere. Are, are we gonna be required to put on a sidewalk to the big Y so someplace those people have some way to get there? Or are they just gonna be cutting across everybody's property? It's gonna, is there gonna be a fence around the unit so that people can't just cut across people's backyards to go to big Y over in that area? Are we going to build a sidewalk for them? How does that how does that work? There's no sidewalk there now. Everybody that goes there now from the housing units, from the houses that are over there, they walk over the guy's lawn on the corner. That's where they that's how they get there. Does that fall under Southampton? I mean, I know the big line but I mean because it has to be the cities that would put in the sidewalks. Yeah, the town line isn't until you get almost a big Y. It's like the corner of the tractor supply is right. almost in the city okay. that's on East Hampton's property. Well, that'll, that'll put them out of everybody's yard. Yeah. Um, but that, that would be a separate project, though. Yeah, there's no... Just their project is creating the problem. So or exacerbating. Is something that we can add to that. Or exacerbating an existing problem. Right. And there's something we could add on to the project and say we, we'd like you to do this just to just for well, keep your neighbor happy. Yeah, the yeah, the state, again, the state, state road, state, state highway. State. It's gotta be the city. Yeah. Greg, is that does the installation of a sidewalk on a state highway also fall under the state's jurisdiction? Absolutely yes, absolutely. It would not fall under the city's jurisdiction at all to do a sidewalk on that section of Main Street. And they would only be required to put a sidewalk if necessary on their own property. I'm not sure how that would play out with the mass DOT process. Yeah. And there again, that's that's a higher authority than we are. Right. All right. <laughs> some guess. Uh, but, all right. Well, if somebody, you know, we can get some answers, that would be nice. I mean, so mm -hmm. so far I've heard that we can't do anything about anything, mm -hmm. which is kind of sad. Yeah. All right. So the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, is there going to be, I think, did I hear you say there's going to be manager out of the complex? There's going to be somebody there all the time that, that's in charge? There will be a management company that oversees the leasing of the property. I believe there's also a stipulation in here that there needs to be a, a property manager on site at certain hours of the day. And just for your information, you're talking about the fiber optics and cable. Just so you know, the fiber optics and cable don't run into the same the same pipe. They need a separate pipe. Right. They could probably put one one fiber optics cable in there through a one four inch pipe, but that has to be a separate issue. And then regular cable that they would use for anything else. So you know. I think in here there is stipulation of of they they use the fiber optic there or the cable examples but not exclusive not exclusively those but we're excluding fire so at some point i mean if it's at all possible i, I would kind of like to see answers and writing to some of this stuff i mean i know you listen to it all but i'd like to see the answer and i appreciate everything you're doing yeah. thank you thank you Hi, my name is Jean Powell Wilson. I'm on Main Street. And every time I say I'm not going to say anything, but then I come up and say something based on what I've heard. So I'm getting the bigger picture. You're creating something. You're creating, yes, you're going to have housing, but then there are going to be children. You're going to be people. They're going to be, they're going to be going to school. There's going to be crossing guards. Children will be crossing. There will be new bus routes. 
and then there's nobody taking care of it. This is a state highway. So we don't hear any kind of, okay, who's gonna take responsibility for that? People crossing, people crossing the road. So you're not thinking about yes. the implications yes, or I'm not hearing that. The design of any road crossings on the state highway fall under the state highway jurisdiction. The if a school bus stop has to be, you know, is, is if it's deemed that there's students that need to be picked up and they are picked up on the highway, they would be picked up no different than any other students picked up on the highway currently, where the bus stops by state law, they must stop. Vehicles, other vehicle traffic must stop. Okay. At least we'll, be able, at least we'll be able to get out of the street. It's just the bus. Yeah, two miles from the Ex excuse me. We're, we're. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'll think about that. Thank you. Thank I'm Gary Wilson, 377 Maine. I'm the major e butter. Yes. Um, did everybody get my letter I sent to Dylan? Yes. Um, just layering questions. Uh, Dylan actually mentioned this a few minutes ago, but the, the boundary line between me and them, is there a plan for that? Because it seems like things have changed in the past. I just don't understand what that plan is. Okay, so this is the property. Mr. Wilson's property is all on here. Yeah. Is there any, has there been any discussion of any changes or anything like that along those property lines? I, I believe that initially that there is no, there was no intended uh, change to the plantings that exist along that boundary. And then at the Conservation Commission hearing, there was talk of removing invasives that are currently growing along that boundary. Um, once we heard that the, the partners, Kestrel Land Trust and the community builders, um, you know, we are happy to leave the plantings as is and would advocate for that to the Conservation Commission, which would have oversight over the removal of the invasives along that boundary. So as of today, we can say that we're supportive of the, the plantings remaining as as is um, there. And that would be another thing that would be under the purview of the Conservation Commission. Okay, that makes sense. But what about the precise boundary line? Like, does that mean somebody can cross the line and take apart the vegetation? No, the, the, oh, no. they would only be allowed to take any vegetation on their property if they were to take any. And okay. the, the property that directly abuts you is the conservation parcel. So there's a, uh, where the access road exists today is the conservation parcel right from Main Street all the way back. Um, so uh, that the whole kind of length of your property before it turns in is the conservation parcel. Okay. So is that a part of this meeting or a different conversation? A part, the, the part, part of the project that we're talking about and part of what Comscom would have oversight over um, directing uh, the partnership to do with those. But again, we would advocate for the, the, the remaining plantings to stay there or the plantings to remain excuse me on the property that we're discussing yes okay and there's going to be like a pins or some sort of boundary identified at some point the entire lot would probably be surveyed at some point correct i presume so yeah I, it's it's been you know, that's, i know that they put markers out already where the you uh Gas line. Gas line is and things like that. So, yeah. Okay. I, I can just add, try to be really quick on that last point. Yes, the property has been survived, surveyed. Uh, final monuments have not been set on the conservation land, but they will certainly as part of the project. Okay. Okay. And there's going to be parking right there at the general boundary area. It's it's off the property a little bit, but. You know, kind of where the, um, I think there's a like a couple of tractors parked out there right now and a and a trailer. It's going to be in or around that vicinity. And what is that uh, material? That's not. Is that a pavement or is that a? That's just gravel. Gravel. 
and it should be slopes towards the major property like yeah, rain yeah. runoff would by by state statute any water accumulated on the property must remain on the property yep okay so it's unlikely any rain runoff is going to come my direction my, my front lawn is a little bit low so that's what i'm worried about uh yeah as far as you know yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we certainly can't yeah can't drain you know the, the off-site um you know, can't change off-site low points but we certainly can't you know as part of the project have got to control runoff from leaving the site okay all right thank you thank you mr chair talking about this issue with uh mark earlier today that was um if you wanted to include some type of condition that would say there will be screening just along that property line because that again that might change as to what's being removed or maintained it just makes it that some type of screening would have to stay be it the current screening or i think in uh even fencing if that would be an option as well should vegetation need to be uh removed as part of concom conditions mr chairman i don't necessarily object i need to defer to julia and uh, jeff squire but if something's being removed because of concom then we can't agree to a condition that says well we have to put something back in so that's just the reality but we can stipulate the you know some sort of a at the end of the parking area there a even if it's a you know, post and rail fence or some sort of guardrail that, you know, limit of conservation area, private property. Yeah, I, I, I conceptually, I understand. Uh, I just have to defer to, uh, to Jeff and, and Julie, if you guys can respond now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just mentioning that, I, you know, insofar as conservation goes, really that boundary line in that area at the front of the property is outside of their jurisdiction. I mean, it's outside of the 100 foot buffer. So they can certainly require invasive removal within their jurisdiction, but I'm not sure they have the ability to require invasive removal all over the property and parts that aren't their jurisdiction. So, you know, at least insofar as that initial hedgerow and vegetation, I don't see any reason why they would, they shouldn't be involved in that. They shouldn't be involved at all. In yeah, that yeah. Portion. Right. If it's outside the jurisdiction, then you and Julia just have to be satisfied as to what the, the new proposed uh, restriction will be or, or condition rather. My uh, my only concern here is I know as one of our conditions that the stormwater plan is going to be reviewed by CONCOM. Should any changes, because there's going to be a parking lot there with an uh, impervious know, surface, should something change where the any vegetation be removed in that area as part of the stormwater management plan but it's just saying that there will be screening that goes back up in there that way we're not we don't have a situation where concom is saying stormwater requires this is being removed and then our conditions are saying that those must be maintained so we're just putting condition in that's just saying some type of screening so leaving what's there or should something need to be removed something would be put back, either a fence or new vegetation, but some type of screening. And we can even say administrative approval on that or review uh, from the board, whichever the board preferred. I think, yeah, yep. the verbiage that an administrative approval will be required should conservation require removal of any of the, the head trucks. It's this, the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction over certain area if they because of the parking area if they get involved in that and they decide they want to remove vegetation we then can deem it necessary to put something okay there. but that's on the 385 side of the boundary line that's still on our it's still on their side of the property they are not going to go on your property mr chairman if i if i could add something that i think might help explain it um it, it seems that more any uh criteria set by the concom related to stormwater controls um, may include incidental removal of the vegetation in that hedgerow. I don't think they'll say you need to move it. It's just like, you know, the grading might push the hedgerow again on our side of the property. Um, so again, if 
any of that vegetation needs to be temporarily removed, you know, to put in the stormwater controls, uh, we will then be required to kind of replant or do some sort of screening to replace that. Um, but again, I, I don't think they're going to require us to actually remove vegetation. It would be incidental to putting in those uh, more strict stormwater controls. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm hearing two different things right now. No, it's that they, he said temporarily, they may. No, but they, are not going, they are not going to go. It would only be on their property. I thought I heard something different. I no. think he just changed um, removal to temporary removal because if, it, as we we're discussing, if there is required removal, it would be temporary because then we would be replanting and returning it. So I think he just changed the word removal to temporary removal. Okay, but on the 385 side. Yes. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any further discussion? Oh, no. Not from here. Okay. At this point, we will close the hearing. Does the board have any further discussion before there's a motion made? I'm good. Somebody make a motion. Um, where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, if I, I may, I can, I can take a shot here at wording how we want to make the motion and somebody can then make it. Uh, Paul, chime in if, I, if I'm making this motion wrong, but uh, approval of the uh, motion to approve the comprehensive permit uh, as conditioned. Um, and maybe we want to say something with uh, the change that we've said here uh, to grant uh, planning staff the ability to make the administrative modifications that have been discussed here uh, in tonight's meeting. Is that motion makes sense paul yeah i think that covers it okay all right um, do you have the conditions and waivers granted in the decision uh, with conditions and waivers sorry so to approve with conditions as conditioned and uh waivered um oh yeah, yeah. And to grant the actually sorry go ahead oh is there anybody i see eight occupants everybody on the screen is accounted for is there anyone else who needs as anything online that has any questions or concerns for public comment for public comment i'm sorry we may have jumped the gun but i don't hear anybody or see anybody so don't see any hands going up so okay yeah all right i make a motion to approve the decision of application for comprehensive permit by general law 40b uh, 20 to 23 with the stipulations that the conditions and waivers that we have Simplified, specified are included. Okay. Just also add the, um, just because again, I'm just going to have to clean this up and you'll have a chance to review and sign the final okay, decision. Yeah. As, say. as as corrected. Okay. Sure. All right. Okay. All right. Motion has been made. Second. Motion has been made and second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Four eyes. Um, we have one member who's not here. Yep, one absent. One absent member. And he has an opportunity to review today's videotape, correct? Because he has not missed any other meetings. Mm -hmm. At that point, does he have the opportunity to then make a uh, decision? Uh, it's going to be a question for Paul. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't bother going through that. Uh, uh, Four, uh, four nothing vote is sufficient to approve, so you don't need the other vote anyways. Okay, I just, I wanna make sure we got everybody covered. Okay, so at this point, I guess, does he then sign later or no? No, 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 it would just be the four of us. So a motion has been made and carried and voted upon to approve the application of 385, 391 Main Street via community builders for the application for a comprehensive permit to create 87 new and rehabilitate 40 existing affordable rental units subject to Mass General Law, Chapter 40B. The property is located at 385 391 Main Street. Thank you one and all for your participation and your understanding of the matter. Thank you very much. Good night all. Thanks. Yeah. Um,
Our next meeting will be next Wednesday at 6 p.m. for a normal Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. And that agenda is forthcoming. All right. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? All right. All right. This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers.